Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Autism Stories. I'm your host, Doug Bletcher, the founder of Autism Personal Coach. Autistic people are the true experts of the autistic experience, and Autism Stories is where we interview autistic people to learn from their stories, experiences, and get their insights. If you would like to be notified about each week's episode of Autism Stories, we suggest you subscribe on your favorite podcast listening platform. We would also appreciate it if you could give us a positive rating and review as it will help others to learn about Autism Stories. On today's episode, Livia Serra joins me to discuss autism and eating disorders, the impact of Autism Stories on her life, and the power of vulnerability. We hope you enjoy today's conversation. Livia, thanks so much for joining me here on Autism Stories. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here, Doug. I'd like for us to uh, start our conversation just by learning about your story. Where does your story in the autistic community begin? Yeah, well, I'd actually say that my story in in the autistic community, before I was part of the autistic community, I'd say my story actually started in the eating disorder recovery community. So kind of backtracking to when I was very little, <laughs> I think, you know, pretty much every autistic person resonates with, you know, knowing you're different when you're growing up, just having that feeling of not fitting in and kind of upon reflection, there were so many classic autistic traits that no one really knew were autism in me, such as like very selective around food, only eating the same exact thing all the time. And if anyone would ever offer anything different, it was like, nope, not going to happen. It's either I have my mac and cheese and chicken nuggets or it's I'm not eating <laughs> yeah just a lot a really hard time making friends I would say I had one really good friend and then three years later I had one another really good friend but I was never really part of like friend groups or whatever because I just kind of felt it was always very fake <laughs> I wasn't interested in the things they were talking about just very shallow and I am a deep loner and I I want like very life philosophical questions answered ready from a very young age yeah kind of like the classic lining up the toys never playing with them <laughs> um yeah I mean the list goes on but when I was 11 and I started learning about health and nutrition in fifth grade I took kind of all the advice and all the recommendations around what we should eat to be healthy how we should move I took them very literally and I just created all these rules for myself, like, okay, you can't eat sugar, you can only eat healthy, this and this. And just my whole diet just, like, changed. And that's what started off as an eating disorder, which spiraled very, very quickly into anorexia. So I was diagnosed with anorexia and depression when I was 11. And that lasted, like, throughout my entire teenage years. And I would definitely say that, and I was undiagnosed autistic all this time, and upon reflection, you know, I always say that my eating disorder was a manifestation of undiagnosed autism with, you know, the ritual and routine, the predictability that an eating disorder gives you. And it also protects you. It's like a mask from the real world that you don't have to deal with. So yeah, that, that lasted for seven, almost eight years until I was just really not doing well. I was like, I can't live this way anymore. So I started to recover from my eating disorder. And fast forward to being recovered from my eating disorder, I started a coaching business when I was 20. And I started coaching other people who were struggling with disordered eating. And this is really where my autism story begins, because my very first client was autistic. And I did not know anything about autism at the time, you know, I will because we're not educated on it <laughs> in the typical system. You know, people associate it with only boys who like trains and are really good at math and don't talk. The very stereotypical rain man, like that's what autism is. But my very first client, I asked her, you know, what caused you to reach out to me? And she had read the story on my blog because I had already been blogging about my eating disorder for a couple of years and how I was recovering from that. And she had said, yeah, I read your story on your blog and really resonated with this idea of being labeled as too complex because 
that's a whole nother part of my eating disorder story that I go in depth into in my book, Rainbow Girl. But basically because of the underlying autism that no one really could put a finger on, the treatment never worked for me. And I really had to recover on my own in that sense. But coming back to that story with the client, she was telling me she really resonated with me and she was kind of telling me her story and how she was kind of given up on in the eating disorder treatment system because of the autistic traits and professionals just didn't know what to do with that. So the more and more she told me about herself, the more and more I was like, you're basically describing my life. I wanted to genuinely learn more about autism. I read the book Asperger Girls by Rudy Simone. And I have never read a book that quickly in my entire life and kind of the rest is history. But I'd say that one interaction, that first session with my first client was how I discovered I'm autistic. (laughs) From what I understand, you've uh, been a listener of many of the Autism Stories interviews. So I'm wondering, um, were there any guests or interviews that have been particularly meaningful to you? Yeah, so first of all, the one you did with Allie Dearborn about the polyvagal theory. I think I've been learning about polyvagal theory last two years, and it's just so, so, so fascinating to me, kind of similar to the way how discovering I'm autistic was like, wow, your entire life like suddenly makes sense. Polyvagal theory for me and really learning about that was a, kind of another piece piece of that puzzle in the sense that, like, the way that I reacted to, you know, stressful situations and just not feeling safe, especially like trauma that I endured during treatment for my eating disorder and how I'm still very reactive in specific ways. The polyvagal theory really helped me to understand that it's not just my brain. It's kind of like a full body nervous system (laughs) reaction. So, I mean, I'm always interested in hearing conversations about polyvagal theory. Then also the one you did with Milani Gray about entrepreneurship, I really liked because I'm an autistic entrepreneur. And there, yeah, a lot of, you know, the books written about how to start a business, how to market this, that it's all very aimed towards no typical people without kind of the, I guess, compassion and the aspect of like that autistic people just do things very differently. And then the last one I wanted to mention was the one you did on autistic joy with Ryan Walsh. And I'm always looking for like the deeper meaning and things and like signs and connecting things that are probably unrelated. <laughs> but I feel like a lot of autistic people do that. And the day that I had listened to that interview on you on autism stories, my mom had sent me a another kind of radio talk where Ryan Wal- Walsh was talking about a A and E. And I was like, how is it that, like, I've never heard of Ryan Walsh before, and now it's, like, on the same day? (laughs) I have, like, two different things. So, yeah, I mean, I just wanted to also say, Doug, thank you for, you know, creating this space for other people to share their stories and their experiences. Because, I mean, autistic people are the best tellers of the autistic experience. So, yeah, just wanted to thank you for that. Well, thank you for um, being here. And you had mentioned it earlier, but a publication of your memoir, Rainbow Girl, My Journey to Living Life in Full Color, was recently released. So in this book, you are very vulnerable, sharing parts of your life that uh, I believe you've never shared with anyone before. So how Mm -hmm. has being vulnerable with others been helpful to you in your life? Yeah, so I mean, first of all, I think I believe that vulnerability is the greatest strength. It really allows you to connect with other people on a much deeper level. I mean, I think this is, you know, why I've never liked small talk. Most autistic people don't like small talk because we want answers to life's deeper questions. We have this very strong inborn like inquisitiveness. We want to understand. And I think you can only create that deeper connection when you are willing to be vulnerable and build trust because you can't build trust with another person if you're not willing to be vulnerable with them i believe and for me personally like i had endured so so much just horror and trauma while trying to recover from my eating disorder trauma and and experiences that i know i'm not alone in and i really 
learned that I wasn't alone based off of the feedback I was getting from other people when I was sharing my story online and, and on Instagram. And that's kind of what inspired me to write Rainbow Girl was I need to get this story out into the world because I need everyone who's going through this to know that they're not alone and especially for them to know that there's hope and that full recovery from an eating disorder is possible no matter what you've been told. Because when I was 15, you know, I was told, you're just going to have to accept the fact that you're never going to get better. You're too complex. I was tossed in and out of treatment centers, but basically they were like, we don't know what's going on with you, but, you know, you're not like our typical patient, so we can't deal with you kind of thing. It was all the autism underneath there. But yeah, I truly believe that, you know, being vulnerable and sharing things that most people are not willing to talk about, those are the topics that most people often want to know more about. <laughs> so that's really why I wrote Rainbow Girl and also why I'm, I'm writing other books as well. I definitely believe that being vulnerable can lead to some great things, but there's, you know, can definitely be concerns about safety when we are being vulnerable. How do you decide the circumstances and people to be vulnerable with? Yeah, so, I mean, like you said with the word circumstance, I definitely believe it depends on the context. But at the same time, I mean, writing a book basically exposes you to the entire world. And I often cannot control the circumstances in, in which someone reads it. Like, I'm sure that, you know, treatment providers that I did give pseudonyms in my book they're going to know that it's them. <laughs> I don't know how they're going to feel about that. I don't know who, how they're going to react to that. But but like I said, I do believe vulnerability is, is the greatest strength. And when it comes to being vulnerable, I guess, in real life, I always kind of have to gauge, like, can I trust this person or not? And kind of tying that back to what I said earlier is that it's necessary to be wrong vulnerable to build trust and I feel like it goes the opposite way too like you need to trust someone or a situation to be vulnerable so in that sense you know I obviously like changed the names in the book because I don't want to have like lawsuits filed <laughs> against me so in that sense like I definitely chose my vulnerability wisely but everything else I share in the book I mean pe I know people are going to think things but at some point, it's like people are going to think things of you anyways, so you might as well have them think things while you're doing things that you love. <laughs> In addition to being an author, you are bridging the gap between neurodiversity and eating disorders. What mm -hmm. are some important things that you think are important to know about the intersection of neurodivergence and eating disorders? Yeah, so as I mentioned earlier, kind of in my story spiel, I do believe that eating disorders are a manifestation of underlying autism when the person is autistic, because obviously not everyone who has an eating disorder is autistic. But yeah, kind of like I always say, when you mix autistic traits, so like difficulty with change, you know, very selective eating, you know, having very strong sensory preferences, needing to know things in advance like when you mix that with food and exercise it's basically the perfect recipe for an eating disorder because you know in a world that is utterly uncontrollable autistic people will seek out ways in which we can control our environment and can feel safe i mean this is tied back to the polyvagal theory as well and controlling your food controlling how you move things that every single person needs to do every single day it's almost a no-brainer easy way to gain a sense of control obviously it's false control because when it's a disorder you reach a point where you are not in control the disorder is controlling you i do think it's really important that you know professionals and clinicians and anyone working with eating disorders really are aware of how autistic traits can present as disordered eating behaviors but are also aware that not all eating disorder behaviors not all autistic traits are necessarily, like, they're not one and the same. So for me, recovering a lot of my tendencies that I still have, autistic traits, like the sensory preferences, like needing food to be a very specific temperature, like the amount of times I use my microwave in a day, like, isn't even funny. Um, you know, just needing when food is involved and when anything is involved, needing to know things in advance, doing 
my treatment, these were all labeled as like disordered eating behaviors. And I was kind of told like, you can only fully recover if you don't have these preferences anymore. But by kind of trying to attack those behaviors, they were trying to basically make me unautistic, which just made everything worse because it made me cling to the eating disorder more because that was what I could control. So yeah, I, I think in the end, it's really, really important that people are able to disentangle autistic traits from, from eating disorder behavior so that you're able to treat the eating disorder and not try to cure the autism. You'd mentioned a little bit about exercise and kind of this whole entanglement of eating disorders. How did that kind of like impact kind of developing an eating disorder? Yeah, so for me, kind of going back to learning about nutrition in, in fifth grade, we were told, you know, you have to exercise for X amount of minutes per day, like that's the recommended amount. And my literal brain was like, oh, well, if that's what I need to do to be healthy, like I need to do X amount of minutes per day to be healthy. But I was already like playing three different sports at that age as well. And on top of that, you know, I started running and that kind of was an underlying autistic trait of like every day needs to be the same that i was like okay it doesn't matter what sport practice i have today like i always need to run every day for this x amount of minutes and when that was kind of mixed with you know not eating enough only eating quote unquote healthy it just led me to have a very disordered relationship with food and then i think another piece of exercise that tends to be really common in the clients I work with who are autistic and struggle with disordered eating is that exercise, it also provides, you know, that serotonin and that dopamine boost. And as I'm sure you know, like autistic people have non-typical levels of both of these neurotransmitters as well as others. So in that way, I think it can also be considered almost like a sensory that to calm yourself down, to calm your nervous system when you can like put all that energy and that sensory buildup into working out or sweating or whatever but then on the other hand i also know that there are autistic people that really struggle with exercise because they don't like getting hot and they don't like getting sweaty and then pair that with like the social piece of like being on a sports team or the gym environment you know so for everyone it's so so different and i think again you've mentioned this on the podcast before we were all unique and no one's story is ever the same on social media, not too long ago, you shared about how people can become addicted to failing at recovery from eating disorders and the importance of taking responsibilities. Were there some specific ways that helped you to take responsibility for your recovery? That post, are you addicted to failing at recovery? I, I know that that must sound kind of very harsh and very blunt, but it was actually, I was inspired to create that post after I had read Stephen Pressfield's book, Turning Pro. And I mean, I love St Stephen Pressfield. He's also the author of The War of Art. And he really talks about how we need to overcome our fear of failure if we want to succeed, because failure and success are two sides of the same coin, obviously. And it's something that I believe a lot as well as like, we're so afraid of failure often. And I think especially if you've grown up undiagnosed, diagnosed or undiagnosed autistic, and you've been shamed and you've been conditioned that you can't be yourself, you've constantly been gaslit and invalidated. You really gather up this fear of like, if I do this, I may upset that person or I may fail at this. But if we are not willing to make mistakes, because I personally don't believe in failure. I One of my favorite quotes is, you don't win or you fail, you either win or learn. I believe that falling down, it, it's all about, you know, getting up and learning how to become stronger. So kind of going back to that post, are you addicted to failing at recovery? I think when we quote unquote fail or think we are incapable or think we can't do something, it confirms our limiting beliefs, which basically let us off the hook from trying again. So in like a different context of writing a book, if you say, I can never write a book, I'm a failure, like I'll never be a su successful author, then every time you go and sit down to write and you're unable to come up with words, you're able to say, see, I'm not a good writer. And it lets you off the hook from putting in the work and getting your words on paper. But then to answer your question about responsibility, I think the moment we choose to see failure as a learning experience rather than actual failure, 
then you are empowered to take action and you're empowered to say, I am afraid. And despite that fear, I'm still going to do this hard thing. And that's how I took action during my eating this photo recovery and how I took responsibility was basically saying, this is going to be hard. I know I'm going to fall down. I know I'm going to make mistakes. And that's what's going to make this all the better of a journey because it's going to mean that I'm going to learn more and really discover who I truly am. And Livia, how can our listeners learn about you beyond this interview? Yeah, so as I mentioned, my book, Rainbow Girl, My Journey to Living Life in Full Color, is officially published. You can find that on Amazon as well as on my website, where I also have all my links to my social media and stuff. And my website is livelabelfree.com, and that's L-I-V and then label free play on words. And I also have a podcast called Live Label Free, the podcast where I really have deep conversations with other autistic people on the overlap between neurodiversity and eating disorders. So that's, yeah, pretty much where you can find me. Wonderful. And Liv, Livia, thanks so much for making time to talk with me today. It was great to get to know you. Yeah, you too. Thanks, Doug. Thanks so much to Livia for the conversation. To learn more about Livia, please check out the link in the podcast description for this episode. Here at Autism Personal Coach, our clients are the experts, our coaches are the guides. The majority of supports for autistics are not helpful. They try to fix us, not support us. That's why many are confused when we say our clients are the experts, experts of their lived experience. Our clients are the experts for what has worked for them and about the things that they need and want in their lives. Our coaches first listen to our clients, then ask thoughtful questions, offer resources, and strategize with our clients so they can get what they need to thrive. Would you want a guide in your life to coach you to get you the things you desire? If so, then visit autismpersonalcoach.com for more information. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Autism Stories, and if you did, if you could tell a friend, foe, or anyone you know about it so they could have the same enjoyable and educational experience as you when listening to Autism Stories, it would be very much appreciated. Until next time, I'm Doug Bletcher of Autism Personal Coach. Talk to you then.